Hello, everybody. Hello, masters of your own destiny. What's going on? Oh, my God. Tell me if I'm happy. I'm very happy. The reason why is because this is the first episode of season six. I don't know how we got to season six. I do know. Ah, I mean, with hard work and care and love. But I cannot believe we are actually kicking season six. And especially with this very special guest that we have today, which is the film director for the movie, Simon Diego Vicentini is with us. So, yes, I'm of course, I'm happy. And I'm happy that you are tuning in and listening to our podcast. I want to remind you that you can go to fsbaseman.com if you're new. Uh, that is our home in the internet, that place called internet. Well, you go there, fsbaseman, you can have the entire library of our past episodes um, in video and in audio. Uh, we have educational tools. We have our mentoring program there. So I recommend to you and go and visit fsbaseman.com. And of course, to subscribe and follow us in all social medias. We're everywhere. I promise you, if you put from Suarez Baseman, we are in TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, we are there. Just look for us and become part of our community. I want to thank WCNY PBS in Central New York for their partnership. It's thanks to that partnership that we can come to you every other week. And our newest member of this crazy partnership meaning this crazy, awesome adventure called from Suarez Spaceman is Central New York Arts. It's thanks to these two non-profit organizations that we can come to you and that we can continue growing and making this podcast better. So again, WCNY PBS in Central New York and Central New York Arts, thank you so much for your trust. Like I mentioned today, we are kicking season number six of from Suarez Spaceman and I couldn't be happier and prouder to have a fellow Venezuelan with us, the director of the movie, Simon Diego Vicentini, is in the basement. And yes, he's a fantastic guest to start this new season. Of course, we're going to talk about the movie, Simon, that is breaking records, have been nominated to the Goya Awards, which is a very prestigious award in Spain. Fingers crossed they can they actually win. And of course, we're going to be talking about his career and everything that have to do with filmmaking. So thank you for tuning in. Let's start this new episode, a new season of From Suarez Baseman with the director of the movie, Simon Diego Vicente. Here we go. Diego, I want to welcome you to my basement. How weird is that? You are in Colombia, Bogota. I'm in my basement in New York. Uh, the magic of technology. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. No, thank you for the invitation. Happy no, day. it's a pleasure. I, I was looking forward to this conversation uh, for sure. For our listeners, you know, we always have this idea that a director is what also Hollywood has portrayed of a director, a guy who scream action. And in your own experience, right? In your own experience, what is the job of a director? What is a director? Sure. So the director would be basically the creative filter for an entire project. So all, basically every decision goes through him creatively. Obviously, you have a team and that's why you want to have a great team that they propose ideas and you trust them and you could do it. But at the end, what kind of wardrobe is this person at the end? The last person to decide is the director, like if they're OK with it or not. So it's the creative filter to set the tone, set the vision for the project. And I mean, the role of the director comes from directing actors. So that's the origin of the of the role. It's the only person on set that really ha has anything to do with the performance of the actors talking to them. And, and you know, you're the one who decides what kind of like what, what you're going to tell them to guide the performance in any kind of way you want. But at the end of the day, it, it really encompasses the entire artistic vision of a project. So from set design to wardrobe to the, the performance to the location, that's all artistic decisions that you are ultimately the filter of those decisions. Which is a lot of work, a lot. And <laughs> and and the other, but it, it's a lot of work, but it's such a, a fascinating process. And I think when you see the final result, it's just like, it's such as a magical process, right? It's a make-believe or things that are not there, but you want people to believe that they are there. And I think that's my fascination with visual storytelling is, is that magic? Is that idea that what you've seen has been created by a team of people to make you believe that that dragon is a dragon, right? And uh, that is fascinating to me. From all those roles, the writing, the, the, the editing, the directing, is any in particular that you like or you enjoy more than another one? 
uh, they're all kind of mixed to me because they're all part of like creating a thing and it's like they're all three are the most instrumental pieces of it so it's like i, I just feel that the like i'm writing thinking of being on set for when i direct it and when i'm directing on set i'm thinking of how i'm going to edit it so it's all like coming together and they all have their their charm i think writing is the most difficult one and it's super solitary you're there banging your head against the wall mm -hmm. directing absolutely fascinating you know you're it's well there's a lot of pre-production but then on set you're there with the actors that's when the magic comes to life something happens on set it's different the performance is different but it's better or it's you know and it rained it wasn't supposed to rain but then you make it work it's all these improvisations and and there you you kind of capture the lightning in a bottle and something happens and and you know and you're seeing the movie be created in front of you like yeah that's the one i'm going to use but then the editing is like also so much fun because it's like now nah, putting the pieces together reordering discovering again the movie because now it's a different movie than the one you had initially in, initially thought it was going to be i don't know they're all have their awesome moments each that's story. awesome diego listen you are i call uh, my students uh masters of your own destiny and in my podcast i interview many many people behind the scenes i always say you know you're you're, you're master of your destiny and i think you are a very good example of what it means to be a master of your own destiny. I mean, I'm doing what I love. I'm going to work for it and I'm going to get there. And of course, Simone is part of a good example of all this effort that you have put, in, you know, for many, many years. Uh, tell me a little bit how the Simone came alive. We know what Simone is. We're going to talk about a little bit about the business behind the sense of distribution and things like that. But How did you came with the idea of Simon? What what brought you to that moment where you say, I need to write this and, and be sure that it's a film? Sure. Well, I was doing a two-year master's program in, in LA studying film. So the thesis thing was just to make a short film. So I had to make one either way. It was 2017, so a particular tough year in Venezuela for protests. Um, and it hit me really hard. And I felt guilty for not being there, for not being part of the protest physically. So the short film became a way to like, how can I contribute something to our fight for freedom uh, and like try to deal with that guilt so I, that's why i made the short and it carried through the movie you know it's like then i saw the impact the short had how people connected to it how important it was for us to tell the story so that's why i just kept going and then turned it into into a feature and it was i mean it was a way for you to participate in that process that is so important for a lot of venezuelans including me uh, uh but One thing is, I, okay, I know I need to do this thesis. I know I need to do a short film. Now I want to do something related to Venezuela. But the story of Simone and the story of what happened to this immigrant that now go into the United States to for an asylum, how how suddenly you realize that's where I want to go? Because, I mean, stories we can tell many. Yeah. But but yeah. when suddenly you realize, no, this is a story about one is to, a student called Simone. Well, typically, and I like working and like reverse engineering my script. So usually it comes from limitations and whatever, and then you figure it out creatively. So, I mean, the short, and this applies to the feature too, like I'm going to shoot it in the U.S. Like I can't go shoot this in Venezuela. The first, because it was just a student project. I have to shoot it in L.A. The second one, because we might have gone to jail or something happened, you know, <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if we went to shoot in Venezuela. So, okay, I want to do something about Venezuela, but I have to shoot it elsewhere. So who's going to be the main character? Like it's somebody outside of Venezuela. Because I can't shoot an entire movie faking locations like it just wasn't the um, an option for me. So it's got to be about somebody who's left Venezuela. Also, that's the perspective I can offer the most insight on because that's what I've lived for 15 years. You know, I left when I was 15. So that's what I identify with the most. And maybe it's the one I can offer the most kind of perspective rather than I don't think I can tell. Or I mean, obviously you could and you do research, but I, I didn't think it would upon me to tell the story of the day to day in Venezuela because I haven't lived that. But not just because I haven't lived it, we can't go shoot there. So that really just took that off the cards. So then you start to build around that. Okay, so it's about somebody, a Venezuelan who's outside. And then like, to me, it was just obvious, like, who do I want the story to be about? It's to me, I just wanted to honor my, the guys from my generation, the, the, the young men and women who have been brave enough to risk their lives, show their faces and, and go to the streets and face military tanks um and gunfire for our freedom it's like if any this movie is going to be about anybody it's about them so that was always just pretty instinctual to me like i i want to make it about them and honor them their memory and and validate the effort they've made and those who who aren't even with us anymore so then you just start to build around that so okay so it's somebody obviously who had to leave so and then you also have certain specific like markers that you want to get through in terms of like 
denouncing to the international community what's going on so it's like i know i want to show tortures because that's crimes against humanity and it's the most universal thing that i think everybody can get behind you know it's not well this is left or right wing whatever mm. it's like no, no, no. Mm. people are tortured here and there's lack of medicine and what and electricity like i think most people can get behind the idea that that's not okay it's not good so also to like be able to to generate this kind of empathy and not get sidetracked with like div political divisions or ideology so that that gave me markers of like i definitely want to show this 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 is the most important um and with the limitations you only have like 90 pages and obviously you want to tell 25 years of venezuelan history but again okay, no, 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 this is the most important and most succinct and also most visual and you know it's not a documentary i can't just be 90 right. pages regurgitating information yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Let me tell you, I mean, I'm I'm fascinated because the, the movie have getting so much traction. I'm sure you are even you yourself are incredible surprise of what's going on. So how is your everyday in the sense that you wake up and realize, okay, I create something that people is loving it. And I hear actually, like I say, uh, award seasons are coming and I hear a lot of boss, uh, which is so excited. Uh, how did you feel about all these success that is coming to you and, and 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 the responsibility, of course, at Disney? I mean, it's it's there's like a beauty to it because like I the obviously I made this movie and I had to like pitch to investors and have to you know plan for it to be successful. You don't want to make a movie thinking like yeah nobody's gonna like it. You obviously making hope and right. think people will like it, but there's like this beauty to kind of seeing the connection between really writing something that's like this is real and it's authentic like it's really what i feel it's the, how the pain i have for my country and everything that's happened you know it's like it's real it's not like what are people gonna like it's like this is what i felt and i felt i needed to say and and for for all of us and then that that's like fitting in, in, in like appropriately with like yes it is connecting with the millions of us that have lived through this um and that's what's you know, I think been the success of the movie that people really are connecting to it emotionally, both Venezuelans who are like watching their own life in a movie or somebody they know. And then also with the international community of like having their eyes open to like, okay, now I understand a bit more because now everybody knows a Venezuelan because we're, you know, everywhere. everywhere. So yeah, there's like this, I don't know, sense of beauty of like wa watching something that, you know, had a really genuine and authentic creation point and then translating to the audience it's like ah oh, it's it's a really beautiful thing to to watch those things come together because i'm mm -hmm. sure it could and maybe you you create something very authentically but maybe it didn't quite get across your intention or something but i think here it is it, it is working like what the intention was what the feelings and and the thing i was trying to to get across and it's and it's getting through to the audience mm -hmm. and, and and listen let, let's talk about the back end of, of a movie in the sense that, you know, the podcast is an educational podcast and good to use your example of Simone has a has an example of, of a overcoming uh, writer and uh, director. How easy is to pitch a movie? How easy? You no, know, I know it's not that easy. I just want to, to hear a little bit. How was the process of pitching the movie to who you pitch? Distribution, for example, how it works that aspect, because I know it's a lot. Well, like you say, Venezuelans, we are now everywhere. Uh, I'm in New York. The movie, unfortunately, I have not had the chance to see it. I have seen the trailers. I've read a lot about you and the movie. Uh, and I'm very anxious to when it's going to come to New York, uh, when it's going to come to stream. How all that behind the scene business aspect? Are you yeah. learning through the process? It's something oh, yeah. completely new. Oh yeah, there's like an entire <laughs> master's program in indie filmmaking because yeah, I, I get to like hold the hand of the project through every step of the way from coming up with the idea to now like sending out the DCPs to the theaters to then play it and like with the with the formatting and and everything. Um, and there's probably two really big bottlenecks where movies die or they don't happen. One is just the financing, like how many movies never get made because you don't find the money. And then probably a lot die in distribution or two, because like to who, where, okay, you made the movie and then like, where is it going to go? Who's going to see it? And how do you market to those people? And how do you get, so those are like the two, I think, major roadblocks to any indie filmmaker or any film in general. So the first one to, yeah, like, how do you get the money um, to make it? So I'm very, 
And like you said, I mean, I think it falls in line with what you're saying about like masters of your destiny or I am very much of that. Like, I just want, like, I know I want to make a movie. So it's like, what are the, what is the most efficient path to making it? So I, you know, I know I wanted to, what I wanted to write, but when I'm writing, I write as a producer, I'm reverse engineering the budget. I'm writing locations that I know are doable. I'm not writing a helicopter in the Himalayas exploding. Cause it's like, I, that's going to need millions of dollars. If it's my first movie, who's going to give me a million dollars to like make a movie. So, okay, no, no, no. How do I really keep this as low budget um as possible and at one point i'm like let me just i imagine a number it's like i think this is a, do, a budget that i can get that would be if I, if I spend a year making phone calls finding investor family and like whatever i think i could get to this number and then basically i had to make one big change to the script like this big protest scene which is like oh we're we'll go shoot in columbus like, i'll make it in slow motion and with a lot of smoke and we hide everybody so we don't need that many extras making adjustments like that uh, on the script that are going to make it manageable to just make it a doable number that a number that you think I can raise this amount of money, which for somebody might be, I know I can raise $25,000 between friends and family, like make a movie for $25,000. No, no, no. I can raise $200,000 with make that movie. It's better than no, no movie. I mean, obviously you have to measure. It's like, are you ready for it? Like do, or do you wait so you can get a bigger budget depending on what the story is, obviously. So I, I did that basically. It was like, which was also a year spent of like what you can imagine, like, First, you got like friends and family. Like, do you know any anyone who's a producer in movies? Do you know any producer? No. Okay, then somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. You get on the call with them. Okay, no, I know this guy who invested one time in a project, and it's always no, 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 no. But people reference you to another person, to another person, and then you just keep going and keep going and keep going. And in meanwhile, I was always refining the script, so it was good actually. If I would have found the money day one, it would have been a much worse movie because like it would have been the fourth version of the script, but it was the eighteenth version of the script which we made. So, but at the end, it was like, it was during COVID, we were in lockdown, like now there's really not, we're not going to find an investor, but then it was in my DMs. So check your DMs. Cause I, in my request on Instagram, like a producer contacted me, he had heard of the short, just wanted to see what I'm up to. And I had like this, and also to be ready, I had the script, I had right. the experience with the short, like I was ready to like, look, this is the script. This is how I plan to do it. I have everything. It's like, okay. Then, then more conversations, obviously. So you know, it's it's like you got to put yourself out there, move, hustle, but also be ready. Like then somebody's like, "Yeah, I have the money." It's like, "Where's the script?" Oh, I haven't finished it yet. Then it's like, right, so right. You got to be ready. And then, and then, yeah, in the post uh, distribution, now it's been learning each day because it, it's been a surprise. This is what's happened. We was like, okay, we, we're going to be in movie theaters in Venezuela because there's easier access to Venezuela and the movies in Venezuela. And that's as far as we thought. And then we're like, okay, we'll see what happens after. But now we're, you know, in theaters in like ten countries and going more but because of what's happened and 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 we've been able to actually skip distribution in a way we're not we don't have a distributor that's us talking directly with the exhibitors which are the movie theaters so but now we've learned how to negotiate with them how to talk with them and then when one movie theater it's done successfully then they notify each other or they become aware now we're getting calls from other movies like cinepolis or cinema markets like hey we heard this movie's like doing well in chile we want it in argentina so it's just like blown over and uh you know it's like i think literally like an indie filmmaker dream that you know you got calls from a movie theater that they want the movie so it's really been incredible and and dealing with every part of the process like building the dcps putting it in shipping it because then we learned we had it in a link the links fail in latin america because the internet's slow so again okay, no no now we have to send everything physical and then uh, it's, yeah, yeah no i mean I, I mean i hear you and i'm so in love with with what you're doing because it's like you have to believe so much in what you are producing and what you've been able you know we take that word believe so so in a in a cheesy you know believe you know blah, blah. but but you really are be, it, it's no way that you would put the effort and the time and the love and the care if you right from the get-go didn't believe you have something in your hand that was very special yeah i mean there, there's many components to it i mean it, like in many not because there's like There's the emotional aspect of my commitment to the country to I want to fight for Venezuela. I want to do whatever I can to help push towards change. So the movie is one way of that. Then you have yourself as a career, as a filmmaker. Like if the movie does well, if like things happen for the movie, then you're going to get your opportunity for the next one. And also the business side of it, like I see them both the same. Like, and I studied finance too in college. So like I've always been very attentive to to numbers and like not just like I, I want to make my movie and the, like money is not a thing. Like, no, I... When I pitched to investors, I had a specific plan and how we're going to recoup the money, the schedule for it, why things cost what they did. And we've actually still been following it exactly like to the month, four years later, what we've been doing. Um, so having a lot of clarity of like what needs to be done to 
to help even on the business side for it to be successful because the, if the business goes well i think it's going to be much easier to pitch for my second movie it's like this is the and these are the numbers and i made this amount of money like easy i just put myself in the place of the investor like oh your movie's fantastic but it tanked like it, nobody it, it, who's yeah. going to put it? so it's really like having the alignment of what it is you really want so it's like it's not even just the movie which has so much weight in terms of like what i want to do for venezuela but then your career and the bit like it's all just united like if it the movie does well this helps Venezuela. It helps my guilty conscience for not being there. <laughs> and it helps the business and it helps, um, yeah, the 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 filmmaking and your, right, your career. And and but let's talk about Simon as a character. Let let's. Uh, it's, it, I always say there is two two well, it's character and characterization, right? So if I ask you who is Simon, you can define. You know, he's a student. That. The question is more deep, right? It's more philosophical. Who is Simon? Yeah, Simon, when I think of him, I think of fire because Simon is, Simon is, is a, well, because he's like a natural leader who, you know, not reluctantly, but just can't help himself to has such an anchoring with, with justice uh, that it's like beyond him and he can't like see injustice. So I, th I think he's one of those just special people that just can't stand down, just, ha just has to do something about whatever circumstance he's put in. No, he's not a politician. He just needs to do something to to protect the things he loves and and can't stand for for injustice. So then all the the situations are created and everything that happens to him. But yeah, that's how that's how I see him. And I think he's that. And and in a broader sense, for the movie, he really represents many, many, many Venezuelans. Because not only is he that special guy who's like the first one in line to fight. When we meet him in the movie in the present day, he's in Miami and he kind of wants to forget about Venezuela. We don't know why. We don't know what happened to him. But it's like, what happened to this dude who was like the, the guy who's willing to die for the country? And now he's like, I don't even want to talk about it. I want to start a new life. And I think that's been all, all a lot of us or may, probably most of us that at some point we're like, I, it's too much. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to deal with it anymore because it's too painful to think of all that we've lost. Okay. And in the process of filming, Timon, I always say that, you know, uh, I'm sure you as a director have those moments where where really there is an emotional connection with the process and the story. Is there any scene, any yes. moment in specific? Yes, there are. Okay, tell me a little more about that scene and why it was so special. Okay, there's a... Uh, when you watch the movie, you'll know what scene it is, so I have to say. There's a scene, it's a very simple scene. Simon and Chucho, his best friend, are in like a little room. So it's a very simple scene. It's just the two of them. Um, and it was a very small room, so there's only me, the camera operator, who's the DP, and the sound operator, the boom operator. Um, so just five of us, and the rest of the crew's outside, so there's like 45 people outside waiting. And, you know, we go through the scene, but it's like an emotional scene, and Simone has to, like, really, you know, do this very emotional performance. We did it once, twice, three, four, five, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. But it was the 14th time, the one that's in the movie, and that one, Christian's performance was incredible, but I'm like leaning, you know, so, so because the camera moves so, so that mm -hmm. I wouldn't be, so I'm like looking down, but he gets into the scene and then I just start weeping that I can't see the monitor anymore just because it's like the DP is like, he's like, I couldn't see it. I didn't know what I was just trying to aim at him because I couldn't see through the either. And usually when I, you know, you say cut immediately, they come in and reset a light or makeup or whatever. After this take, like, Nobody had to say anything. I said cut barely that and like there was a quiet, nobody came in the room. Then slowly they kind of opened the door. Christian was like crying in a corner. I was like really crying. They brought in like a Kleenex. And then we are like, we need to step outside to grab some air. And when I go outside, I see the 45 people all crying, like everybody in oh. the corner. Like right. We had to actually stop production for like 20 minutes. Like, okay, everybody go outside. Some people went to the bathroom to like keep crying in a stall and we like took a break from filming because that one was like that one destroyed all of us so and that was one that was the most special moment to me in the because it was also day 18 out of 30 so it was like a little past halfway so that was when you're also like okay we have a movie if we just had this connection with the reality that we're fabricating that we know it's high. like we just did it 14 times i wrote that thing and it's like and it's hitting us like this okay i think we can mess up somewhere else, but this was the one we could have messed up. And now we we have it. We have the shot. So uh, that was a really like cathartic too. 
And Diego, I, a lot of people were surprised the fact that you were able to actually show the movie in Venezuela. How was the process and how suddenly, because I, I mean, yeah, like people was like, oh, how, how they give them the permission to do this? Yeah, so the general expectation, everybody thought it was going to be censored, including us. So, which also helped because when I wrote it, I'm like, I'm going to assume this is not going to play in theaters in Venezuela. So I'm going to write whatever I want. I didn't have to like, let me maneuver it in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really wrote what I wanted, um, but we were still going to do the processes to like, so they would have to censor us. We weren't going to like not even try like, okay, we want to submit it to get a distribution in Venezuela to play it in theaters. Like every Venezuela movie has the right to at least be two weeks in theaters. So the first thing was getting like a certificate that it's a Venezuelan movie, which has to go through El Senac, which is a governmental mm -hmm. agency. So, I mean, we filled all the requirements. It's a, it's about Venezuela, made by Venezuelans, director of Venezuela. Like, uh, and they approved that they gave us the certificate, even though they asked for some random ass things that they like, but whatever. And we had, we had all of them. And, but in the certificate, there was like a clause uh, that said, notwithstanding, we deem that the content of this movie might be in violation of the law against hatred and peaceful cohabitation, which is 10 to 20 years in jail. Um, but it was like a little warning or something. And, uh, and then, but we had our distributor and we had plans to release. Then I went to Venezuela for the first time in 13 years to the festival, but that was a whole, that's a whole nother story. And then two days before the release in theaters, there was like a news came out that somebody had, a lawyer had made a, a claim uh, that we were inciting against violence, uh, inciting uh, yeah. something, mm -hmm. but nothing came. We never received a legal anything. So, you know, I was able to, to release and there's a lot of like speculation about why my interpretation is that they basically made a bet that this movie wasn't going to do much. One, if you just look at the last two years, the average attendance for Venezuela movies was 5,000 people in the entire country. So if you just look at the historical average, like, oh, what? Or it does really well. 7,000 people see it, 8,000, 10,000. Like, it's worse for them to just, like, censor it off the bat. Now that's press. Clearly a dictatorship. No freedom of expression. That just gives us so much more feel. Like, this is why we made the movie and international press and all that stuff. Um, so I think, and they've learned, you know, they censored other movies in the past and gave them more press. So I think to me, their bet was like, don't even talk about it. Don't, don't mention it. Cause then when we won the festival, the Venezuelan film festival, which is the biggest one in the country, El Senac didn't even mention the movie. There's no mention of it anywhere. They would post about other movies on their Instagram, congratulating everybody. We won the top prize, no mention. And then when we got selected for the Goyas, no mention. So it's been clear that there's a pattern of behavior, mm -hmm. not wanting to mention it. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I think their bet was like, nobody would see it, especially post pandemic, like who goes to the movie theater and with the economy collapse. But the surprise was probably that if the average was 5,000, we're right now at 113,000 people that have gone to see it in Venezuela. Well, and let me tell you, this has been an awesome conversation. I am so proud of what you have been able to accomplish. And I, like I say, I'm no, uh, uh, not, you know, I'm brujería, but I can see a, a very bright future ahead of you. It's already there. And I think uh, as a Venezuelan, we, we thank you for for thinking about making Simone. And, and, and I cannot wait. Of course, no, thank you. And I'll let you know when, when we have news about New York. No, thank you. And again, before we go, I want to thank WCNY, PBS in Central New York. And I want to thank Central New York Art for the partnership. This has been an amazing conversation, conversation that can come only with the support of this uh, two amazing uh, partners. And I want to thank, of course, you, the audience, for tuning in like you do, and, of course, my production team. Thank you, everybody. Love you. Keep safe, and we will see you in two weeks. <laughs>